Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of Vietnam. In the previous lecture, we concluded with a discussion of the Diem regime and the Kennedy presidency, both of which ended in November 1963 with assassinations. Now assuming the presidency of the United States was Lyndon Baines Johnson. Johnson is something of an unfortunate figure. He was a master politician as a senator from Texas, extremely skilled at getting things through Congress. He was the most avid social reformer since FDR. His domestic plan was known as the Great Society, which involved broad reforms to deal with the race issue, poverty, created Medicare and Medicaid, and so on. But he was also consumed with the Vietnam War. He listened to his advisors, and he listened to the public, and all the feedback he got pointed to escalation of the war. So he increased American involvement dramatically, and ultimately the domestic reforms he cared so much about were lost as the nation became obsessed with the conflict in Vietnam. He took office with the highest of hopes and the most ambitious reform agenda. He left it saddled with this legacy. As one historian has written, quote, he was the only president to lose two wars, the War on Poverty and the Vietnam War. In this lecture, we'll look more closely at the presidency of this intriguing man, Lyndon Johnson. Johnson was born on August 27, 1908, in rural Texas. He was raised in poverty and had a very modest upbringing, early career, and education. He's the farthest thing imaginable from many of the other presidents who attend elite boarding schools and Ivy League universities. He began his career as a country school teacher, but eventually found his ambitions beyond that position. He moved to Washington, D.C. and worked as a clerk in the FDR administration. He had a deep admiration for FDR and worked his way through the administration as a minor official and eventually was elected to Congress and served as one of the most loyal New Dealers. He was elected to several terms and got the ironic nickname of Landslide Linden after the 1948 election, when he won his Senate seat by only eight votes. He was first elected to the Senate in 1941 and also spent time in the Navy during World War II. After the war, he was re-elected to the Senate and later served as Senate Majority Leader. During this time, he worked tirelessly. He slept only a few hours a day and stayed at the office late at night. He was the classic case of the first one in the office in the morning and the last one to leave at night. He also became a master politician. He was an extremely skilled negotiator, which we'll discuss uh, in just a few moments. He tried for the Democratic presidential nomination in 1960, but lost out to John F. Kennedy, who eventually chose him as his vice presidential candidate. And of course, he assumed the presidency when Kennedy was assassinated on November 22, 1963. Johnson was a master politician. He was incredibly skilled at negotiation and at getting things through Congress. He kept an impeccable internal list of favors owed from other congressmen and knew exactly when to call in those favors. He was also known for the so-called Johnson treatment. As a large man himself, he stood six foot four and was very physically imposing. He would often get into people's faces, lean into their personal space, and intimidate them. He simply would not accept no for an answer. In the Johnson White House, a greater contrast with the graceful and elegant Camelot days of the Kennedy presidency can scarcely be imagined. Johnson was crude, he wasn't particularly likable, and behind the scenes he belched, scratched himself, and swam naked in the White House pool. He also had a way of bending the truth. He wasn't above telling small lies to get his way, and in the case of Vietnam, Small lies led to bigger lies, 
leading eventually to the credibility gap, which becomes so much of what we talk about associated with this war. He exaggerated the threat of the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which we'll discuss in a future lecture, and made promises to congressmen that he later broke. Ultimately, there came to be a saying around Washington, How do you know when he's telling the truth? When he scratches his head, rubs his chin, or knits his brow, he's telling the truth. When he begins to move his lips, he's lying. Johnson focused most of his attention on domestic programs. He began to implement a broad range of domestic reforms he called the Great Society. In particular, he declared a war on poverty on the American home front. He was also concerned about civil rights and inequality in America. It remains one of the sad ironies of LBJ's presidency that it is Johnson who escalated the war that ultimately involved millions of Americans in combat, many of them from the poorer classes that Johnson sought to protect. It's also ironic that escalation of the war and its expense ultimately were the undoing of the great society at home. Johnson's grasp of foreign affairs was far from brilliant, at times even simplistic. He applied similar methods to his diplomacy that were successful in Congress. He was blunt, strong-armed, and offered favors and flattery. He was particularly ignorant of Vietnamese history and culture. He couldn't understand why Ho Chi Minh was so popular and why American involvement might not be welcomed. So he leaned on his senior advisors, keeping on most of Kennedy's staff, although he questioned them less than Kennedy did. Especially important were Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy, Secretary of State Dean Rusk, and U.S. Ambassador to South Vietnam Maxwell Taylor. He kept on most of Kennedy's staff and promised to uphold Kennedy's intentions and vision, at least throughout the first year of his presidency. As such, he really didn't question America's commitment in Vietnam. He considered it a vital strategic interest and continued to believe in the domino theory. Two days after becoming president, he said, I'm not going to lose Vietnam. I'm not going to be the president who saw Southeast Asia go the way China went. At the same time, Johnson was reluctant to escalate American involvement. Especially with the election of 1964 on the horizon, he didn't want to appear weak, while at the same time, he didn't want to appear too hawkish, too eager for war. As one historian has put it, doing more, doing less, or doing more of the same all entailed enormous risks. So Johnson, at first, authorized more of the same as the, Gen the Kennedy administration. He sent more advisors, along with continued economic and military aid. He also authorized more covert operations. The challenge for Johnson, as he began to wage his re-election campaign on the home front, was how to win the war without escalation. We'll discuss in future lectures exactly how he hoped to achieve that and, of course, the fact that he failed. In South Vietnam, in the meantime, the political situation was growing increasingly tenuous. In the year after Diem's death, a succession of coups toppled one leader after another. Attempts to establish a stable government to rival Ho Chi Minh and Pham Van Dong in the north appeared hopeless. Diem himself was replaced by a military junta, led by General Minh. Under Minh, this junta completely eradicated the last vestiges of the Diem regime and undid many of the strict policies of that administration. Saigon once again became a noisy and cosmopolitan city. At the same time, the lack of repression allowed the old political divisions of the city to resurface. Buddhists and Catholics, labor leaders and those of a variety of political persuasions debated in the streets and rallied followers to their cause. In the South Vietnamese countryside, the Viet Cong continued to grow in strength. In Hanoi, 
a meeting of the Laodong, the Labour Party leadership, in December 1963, decided to step up their efforts. They escalated the southern insurgency. They decided to improve the Ho Chi Minh Trail and send more units of the People's Army of Vietnam south. And they decided to launch a general counteroffensive. So while conditions seemed to deteriorate in South Vietnam, North Vietnam stepped up their efforts to complete their revolution. For its part, the military junta in South Vietnam seemed prepared to approach the North for compromise. Their methods were conciliatory. They responded positively to French President Charles de Gaulle when he offered to help Vietnam achieve a peaceful reunification of the country. To Lyndon Johnson and Washington, neutralization was seen as defeat. A neutral and unified Vietnam would surely become communist before long. The military junta was not popular with Washington, and they tacitly supported still another coup in January 1964, which brought to power Major General Win Khan, pictured here. Khan made clear that he would work with the United States and support their intervention, but stability remained elusive. There would be five more coups in South Vietnam over the following year. The United States sent Robert McNamara to South Vietnam as a show of support for Khan. He toured with the general and made speeches, but the attempt may have backfired. Khan was small and McNamara large, and it appeared that he was just a pawn of the United States. Also, McNamara failed to win over the South Vietnamese audience. At one point, in giving a speech, he shouted a phrase that he thought said, Vietnam a thousand years, but he pronounced it incorrectly, and many thought he said, Southern duck wants to lie down. McNamara's reports back to Lyndon Johnson were bleak. The countryside was slipping into Viet Cong control. He estimated 30 to 40 percent of the countryside was already in VC control. Arvin desertion rates were high. He warned, The situation is very disturbing. Current trends, unless reversed in the next two to three months, will lead to neutralization at best and more likely to a communist-controlled state. He recommended to Lyndon Johnson to increase the American president's presence, strengthen the Arvin, and perhaps take the war to the north. Johnson responded by further increasing the number of his advisors. In the meantime, a State Department study group began to contemplate bombing the North. Such bombing would presumably serve a number of purposes. It would put military pressure on the North. It would weaken their nascent industrial economy. It would also demonstrate American resolve and support for Khan. And it would boost Southern morale. In May of 1964, the Joint Chiefs of Staff proposed a sequence of gradually escalated military operations in North Vietnam. These would include bombing missions, mining the North Vietnamese ports, and it was thought they should be accompanied by a resolution authorizing the President to do whatever necessary in Vietnam. This demonstrated the tendency of the Johnson administration to continue to look to North Vietnam for answers to their problems in the South, and to seek the solution to political problems with military answers. But Johnson was still reluctant to escalate involvement at the expense of his domestic reforms with the election just a few months away, and he didn't want to seem aggressively going at his own. He wanted more international support for the campaign in Vietnam. And so in April 1964, he announced the so-called More Flags campaign, seeking more help and international support for his efforts in Vietnam, particularly from close allies like Britain, Australia, and Canada. For a variety of reasons, these nations found their commitment to supporting America in Vietnam half-hearted at best, and in some cases breaking with American policy altogether. This indicated a weakening of those alliances rather than a strengthening of it, and eventually the More Flags campaign was abandoned and determined a failure. 
At around the same time, in June of 1964, Johnson authorized further use of Operation Plan 34A, which I mentioned in a previous lecture. These were covert operations against the North, particularly along the coast. Air and naval surveillance missions, commando raids against radar sites and coastal military installations, and limited bombing along the Loatian border to prevent resupply of the South were all involved in these operations. Also in June, Johnson promoted the resolute and energetic General William C. Westmoreland to replace Harkins as the commander of the Military Assistance Command in Vietnam. For the next four years, Westmoreland would be the most visible U.S. military leader in Vietnam. In our next lecture, we'll continue talking about American escalation efforts of the war, and particularly the Gulf of Tonkin incident and resolution.